Chair Moore, I think you're muted or you're unmuted but not talking. Thank you. Good afternoon. So we will now resume uh, the March California Reparations Task Force hearing. We will go straight to uh, the next item in our, on our agenda, which is the Community of Eligibility Panel. Uh, so we'll hear from first Dr. Evelyn McDowell, then Dr. Antoinette Harrell, and others in the interest of time. I will introduce the speakers one by one. So the first presenter Madam, we'll hear Madam from Chair, is Dr. Madam Chair, we need to reestablish the quorum. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, so, Parliamentarian mm -hmm. Johnson, can you please um, establish a roll call vote so that corner can be established. Thank you. Thank you. I will call the order uh, beginning with Chair Moore. Present. Vice Chair Brown. Member Bradford. Member Grills. Present. Member Holder. Present. Member Joan Sawyer. Member Lewis. Present. Member Tamaki. Here. Member Montgomery Step. Here. Total number of members present is six. There are nine members on the on the task force. Five members are required to establish a quorum. With six members, a quorum has been established or reestablished. Thank you, Parliamentarian Johnson. Now that a quorum has been reestablished, the, the task force hearing is now called back into order. So again, we will go straight to the community eligibility now, and we will hear from a series of speakers who have less than 10 minutes each, and I will be timing people in the interest of time. So the first person we'll hear from is Dr. Evelyn McDowell. Dr. Evelyn McDowell is an associate professor and accounting department chair at Ryder University in New Jersey. Dr. Um, Evelyn McDowell, you may begin your testimony now. Okay, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay, yes? Can you hear me? Hello? Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. <laughs> okay, good Good morning, um, um, maybe this afternoon. Uh, thank you to Camilla Moore, chairperson of this task force, and um, her fellow committee members. Special thank you to the Secretary of State, Shirley, Shirley Weber, for her leadership. I am honored to be called to speak before this groundbreaking, history-making committee. I applaud your efforts. Um, I, I am also the president and chair of the board of the National Society of Sons and Daughters of the United States Middle Passage, the first lineage society specifically for descendants of enslaved people born in this country. We have close to 100 members um, who, in order to join the, the, the organization, they had to successfully trace themselves to someone who was enslaved under this system of um, inhumane uh, U.S. chattel slavery, where millions of individuals over many generations lost their freedoms and suffered cruelties, uh, both documented and beyond imagination. We celebrate our ancestors' triumphs over an extreme adversity and their contributions to our country and the world. Organization was founded in 2013, and its mission is to connect and uh, com uh, connect members, com commemorate our ancestors, educate the world about the ills of U.S. chattel slavery and its continued effect. And also, we also want to educate people about the resilience of our of our ancestors. We we hope to bring healing through truth and stand as a reminder to never uh, uh, again allow any people, any groups of people to be treated in this manner. Uh, next slide. Um, you can go one more slide. The organization um, does not have an official stance on reparations. However, we are currently studying it. Speaking for myself as a descendant of over 30 enslaved people, 
I offer my full support for reparations because it's the most meaningful way to bring a measure of justice for the atrocities committed and to close the many, many, uh, this trillions of trillions of dollars wealth gap and to bring healing and honor to our nation. And I am sure many of our, my, of our fellow members feel exactly the same way. Next slide. My purpose here is to tell the committee that it is absolutely possible to trace one's lineage, lineage to individuals who were um, enslaved in, in the United States. For the vast majority of African Americans, it is um, relatively easy when you use the negative um, evidence in a, in a proof argument uh, to, to state the enslavement status of an ancestor. Negative evidence is the inference one can draw from the absence of what should exist under certain, certain conditions. Um, and I will present some ideas later on about more efficient ways to identify enslaved ancestors. I'll walk you through the process using my own uh, family. Next slide. So step one, you wanna find your parents and their parents on the most recent census by going back census by census until you find the situation. The, uh, thankfully, the Census Bureau will be publishing the 1950 census in just a few days. For me, my father, Irvin Anderton, was living with his parents, Boston Lincoln and Irene Anderton, in um, Blount County, Aniana, Alabama, on the 1940 census. Next slide. For um, the, the, the next step uh, you need to do is to find your grandparents living with their parents, your great grandparents. Um, if you don't know who they are, you can find them in many sources, including death certificates. Uh, this happens to be uh, my, gra my grandfather's death certificate. Next slide. I, would con I uh, then continue to go back it through each census until I, at the time I find um, my uh, grandfather living with his parents on the 1910 census, where I found um, him living there. Um, Please note his race, age, birth dates, uh, birthplaces, and uh, of these ancestors. On the 1910 census, uh, my grand great grandfather William was age 48, and uh, my great grandmother Easter um, was born uh, was um, had her her age was 57. Excuse me. Um, if you do the math, she was born in 1852. Next slide. And on the next side, we see this very key piece of negative evidence. Um, this is an Alabama law passed in 1832, virtually eliminating its free people of color by threatening to torture and re-enslave them if they didn't leave. So anyone in Alabama after February 1, 1833, but before 1860, the December 1865, was most likely enslaved because free people of color were forced to leave. If her mother was free at, the, at her birth, Easter would not have been born in Alabama. Another form of negative evidence supporting enslavement is the absence of qualifying ancestors on the 1850 and 1860 non-slave census, since enslaved people would have been listed. Next slide. Using the genealogical proof standards, I can stop here because I have critically tested relevant evidence through a process of analysis and uh, correlation to show that my ancestor, Easter Staten Anderton, my great grandmother, was more than likely enslaved. Her race is identified as black, generally um, only uh, people identified as black, Indian, or mulatto were enslaved. She was born in, in Alabama in 1852, between 1833 and 1865. Um, her mother was born in Alabama as well and was most likely enslaved since she too resided in Alabama in the effective dates of the law. Many, many slave states had this similar law. Also, I did not find Easter Staten nor her parents enumerated as free on the 1850 or the 1860 census. So I, I believe I have successfully proven that my ancestors were enslaved in just a few steps using negative and other evidence. But for membership and sons and daughters, we ask people to go a bit further to get more detailed information because we want their stories to be told. Um, in this particular case, 
my uncle, who actually saw and heard Easter, spe uh, Easter Staten speak um, about her enslavement. He's, he's still alive today and he's seen her with his own two eyes. I also traced um, Easter Staten's mother, uh, to her, her, to, which would be my second great grandmother, to a will of the enslaver. He was only eight years old and listed as inventory just above the hogs and the furniture. Very devastating to see that. Um, the same, um, the same use Dr. of negative Dow? energy can be used for, yes. Um, you have a minute or and a half. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm okay. Uh, next, next slide. Okay. Um, so in conclusion, um, finding evidence of enslavement is fairly easy to do using this process. It's a powerful, simple, and it's a great tool when positive evidence like bills of sales, um, inventory list deeds is diff are difficult to obtain. Additionally, to add to the power of negative evidence, I'm proposing a creation of a database of free black immigrants um, and their descendants arriving between 1808 and 1865, according to the 1850 and 1860 censuses, uh, less than 10,000 people uh, actually immigrated voluntarily to the to the United States. Um, if an ancestor was born before the end of chattel slavery, they would be listed. I mean, they would not be on this list, and we can use this as negative evidence. In addition, I, I would like to also um, propose that uh, that the government uh, prepare a database of enslaved people and use reverse uh, genealogy to connect uh, those enslaved people with their descendants. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to speak with you, and I look forward uh, to your questions. Jim, are you there? It looks like the chair and the vice chair are not here. Uh, so perhaps DOJ can help us out and move us to the next speaker. Thank you, Doc. Uh, sh sure. Um, this is Michael Newman. I think we'll move on to Dr. Antoinette Harrell. Well, I do not have the bio, so please, uh, Dr. Harrell, if you're on, please proceed with your discussion. Uh, if Dr. Harrell is not on, we, we can come back. Uh, Dr. Hollis Gentry, uh, you're next on the list, um, and I do see you in there. So thank you very much, Dr. Hollis Gentry. Thank uh, you. Please proceed with your discussion. Yes, good afternoon, and thank you to the members of the California Reparations Task Force, fellow genealogists and attendees at today's meeting. I'm honored to participate in the discussion connected with this important legislation. Determining who belongs to the community of eligibility is at the root of today's discussion. My personal journey reflects and supports that African Americans can document their connections to enslaved ancestors. Next <laughs> slide, please. I trace my maternal ancestry to enslaved matriarch Florianne, whose daughters Rose and Marianne Reynolds emerged in Norfolk, Virginia court records in 1825 after Rose paid $500 to free her younger sister from a slave trading family. I traced my enslaved paternal ancestry to Civil War veteran Corporal Fielding Lyle of Company B of the 114th Regiment of US Colored Troops, 
who used his $200 military bounty in 1874 to buy 20 acres of land. Those acres formed the nucleus of a town that still stands today called Lyle Town, named after its founder and located in Clark County, Kentucky. Next slide, please. And finally, I trace my maternal enslaved ancestry to Rachel Hodges of Portsmouth, Virginia, a woman <laughs> sold away from her family in the 1850s. A woman whose son, Mills Sumner Jr., found his mother in Atlanta, Georgia, after a 26-year search. It required the same number of years to research these ancestors, to reunite mother and son visually with photographs, because different elders held different heirlooms and each only knew small parts of our family's history. I offer these stories to exemplify the types of discoveries possible through research. The first example, historian Dr. Tommy Bozier's study, Three Blacks in Norfolk, traced the history of free African-American Helen Robinson Harris to enslaved ancestors, Florian Rose and Marianne Reynolds. The second example, historian Harry G. Enoch's 2011 Winchester Sun newspaper article, where in the world Lyle Town, a black hamlet, combined private court and public records to document the founding of a community by a formerly enslaved man. And the last example of Rachel Hodges and Mill Sumner Jr. showed how piecing together different sources, oral history, family heirlooms, and public records, such as the Atlanta, Georgia, Friedman Savings Bank account record can flesh out stories and connect African Americans to their enslaved ancestry. Next slide, please. My genealogy journey began in the, uh, during the U.S. Bicentennial in 1976 in the halls of the National Archives in Washington, D.C. when I was 13 years old. There I met James Walker, a founder of the Afro-American Historical and Genealogical Society, he helped me navigate through archival records and sources. I also later met Reginald Washington, Walker's successor, who developed research guides and programs on African-American genealogy. Through these two men and other archive staff, I witnessed the valuable work being done by the National Archives to increase access to federal records and assist with African-American genealogy and enslaved family research. Next slide, please. After college, I worked in special libraries, which led to my position as a professional genealogist at a premier U.S. lineage society, Daughters of the American Revolution. While there, I reviewed, approved, or rejected several thousand applications of women who traced their lineage to Revolutionary War patriots. I contributed research to two books, Forgotten Patriots and Women of the Revolutionary Era, publications that identified thousands of sources documenting African Americans, Native Americans, and women who supported the American cause during the war. I also helped document that Eunice Russ Ames, Amos Davis, the daughter of Patriot Prince Ames, and the granddaughter of an enslaved man, joined the Lineage Society in 1896, more than 80 years prior to the date when the members believed the first African American woman joined their Lineage Society. My years at the DAR exposed me to an array of genealogical sources, publications, and institutions that documented African-American lives dating before America's founding. I discovered published sources with segregated information, and by this I mean records where African-Americans and people of color were listed separately from whites. I realized, ironically, that some of those biased record-keeping and publishing practices help current genealogists identify African-American ancestors more readily. I share this part of my journey to further emphasize that enslaved Africans, African-Americans, Native Americans, and others appear in multiple types of sources and records as enslaved people. And that evidence needed to trace enslaved ancestry exists in abundance in primary, secondary, and derivative sources. Next slide, please. My genealogy journey carried me to my current position at the Smithsonian Libraries and Archives branch at the National Museum of African American History and Culture, where I serve as a genealogy specialist, providing genealogical and historical reference assistance 
to museum staff and the public. Next slide, please. I also support the museum's, um, uh, one slide back, please. There. I also support the museum's crowdsourcing project where volunteers help us transcribe 1.7 million images of the Freedmen's Bureau digital records collection. Our goal is to provide genealogists, historians, and other researchers with full text searchable free online access to the records. To date, more than 37,000 volunteers have helped us transcribe more than 340,000 of the 1.7 million digital images. The Freedmen's Bureau records provide information crucial to documenting pivotal generations of African Americans between enslavement and freedom. Created in 1865 by Congress to manage abandoned lands, help white refugees, and assist the formerly enslaved, Bureau operations extended across 15 states, Western territories, and Washington, D.C. Bureau agents recorded incomparable details about African American individuals and families. And it is this body of records that will assist some of the potential members of the community of eligibility in tracing their lineage to enslaved ancestors. Next slide, please. I've highlighted the positive experiences connected with enslaved family research. However, there are negatives. Genealogical research is a time-consuming, costly process. Slave era research is challenging because the system varied over time by place and by the form of slavery practice and by the manner in which the records uh, documented enslavement. I generalized the types of records I used to document my enslaved ancestry. Those records were scattered across a multitude of research institutions across the nation. Looking Excuse at me. California. Ms. Gentry, I'm so sorry to interrupt. You have about one minute, one minute warning. Okay, I'm, I'm closing. Looking at California genealogical and historical resources and the possible places of enslavement of the ancestors of the community of eligibility, I have drafted a short list of suggestions to consider as you continue meetings, debates, and discussions beyond today's gathering. Time limits prevent me from reading the suggestions. This concludes my remarks, and I have submitted the list of suggestions in writing for the record. If members of the task force have any questions, I'm happy to address them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Gentry, for your expert testimony. Uh, so we'll now turn to, if doc, is Dr. Antoinette Harrell on the call? If not, we'll go to Kelly Farish. Kelly Farish is a dedicated genealogist with over 15 years of experience in DNA analysis and lineage tracing using DNA. Dr. Kelly Farish, you may proceed. Thank you, distinguished panelists. The question my presentation seeks to answer is if the criteria to, re to receive reparations is based on one's lineage and descent from American chattel slavery, how do you successfully identify persons who descend from this system using genealogy? To answer, we will discuss what genealogy is and how it is used, what it means to be classified as African-American and descend from the system of American chattel slavery, laws that shaped immigration affecting African-Americans across the diaspora, the five generations of enslaved Africans who to expect to find in your research, the generations that exist today and their proximity to an enslaved ancestor. In the end, I will show you a visual tutorial on how to conduct genealogy research using familysearch.org, a completely free website. Genealogy is defined, uh, next slide please. Genealogy, Genealogy is defined as the tracing of lines of descent. A genealogist then is someone who traces or studies lines of family descent. Professional <laughs> genealogists apply the genealogy proof standard to every research assignment to which there are five components. Reasonably exhaustive research, complete and accurate source citations, thorough analysis and correlation, resolution of conflicting evidence, soundly written conclusion based on the strongest evidence. With the modern availability of research tools, all of us can apply these standards to personal research projects using websites like familysearch.org. If we have time, I can point out how the standards were used in the visual example. Uh, when applying genealogy to an assignment like this one, it is important to consider the question and the many ways the question can be answered. 
First, we must define what it means to be African American. For the sake of this discussion, African Americans are those involuntarily brought to the United States for the purpose of being enslaved. Using genealogy to prove descendancy from this group would involve tracing one's lineage back to either a person enslaved in this system or a time when there was little to no presence of legal voluntary immigration from African or Caribbean countries. While the system of slavery existed, there were no immigrants from either African or Caribbean countries coming to the United States voluntarily. The 1790 Naturalization Act stated only white men from Western European countries living in the United States for two years were able to become citizens. This act was expanded in 1870 to include Africans. The Reed Johnson Immigration Act of 1924 implemented national origins quotas. The quotas provided visas to 2% of the total number of people from each nationality in the US as of the 1890 census. This quota allowed for just 1,200 people from the African continent to immigrate to the United States by 1925. In contrast, tens of thousands of Caribbeans matriculated to the United States between 1910 and 1930. Therefore, tracing an ancestor back to the early 1900s living anywhere in the country would prove descent from American chattel slavery since the only Africans that were here were the ones brought in voluntarily if unable to identify an, ans an, an enslaved ancestor by name. A survey of census data at the time also showed there to be a negligible number of voluntary immigrants to the African, of the African diaspora living in the South prior to the Great Migration of 1910 through 1940. Therefore, tracing one's ancestry to the Southern United States prior to the Great Migration of 1940 would also prove that one descends from American chattel slavery even if not being able to identify an enslaved ancestor by name. Because freedom came in waves. Oh, if, if you can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Because freedom came in waves during slavery, depending on the state you were enslaved or the interpersonal relationship with an enslaver, one's descendancy from American chattel slavery may connect you with one of five generations of enslaved persons as described in Professor Ira Berlin's book, Generations of Captivity. The first generation is the charter generation. This represents the 1600s um, during the colonial period. One in five enslaved persons were able to negotiate their freedom during this time. The plantation generation represents the late 1600s to early 1800s. Um, this, is when it's, uh, this is when the system of plantation um, slavery was very robust and completely developed. Slaves worked harder and died younger during this period, so it's pretty difficult to trace ancestry back to, to this period, but it is possible if your ancestors were freed early on during slavery. The revolutionary generations represent late 1700s to early 1800s. The North abandoned slavery at this time. Slave rebellions more frequent and violent. Slave laws become strict in the South. Enslaved identify home as Africa and not individual tribes during this time. The migration generation, 1810 to 1861, is the second middle passage, and this is when slaves were moving deeper into the South from areas like Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina. In a research assignment, you more than likely will back into someone from this generation of slavery. And the last generation is the freedom generation, that is between 1861 and 1890. Um, and these are uh, those enslaved persons that were freed um, because of the Civil War and lived post-Civil War. Last, um, and if you can go to the next slide. Lastly, before watching the tutorial, depending on the generation you are in now, will determine just how far removed you are from an enslaved ancestor. Those in the World War II generation up to the Gen X generation, there is a separation from an enslaved answer but from an enslaved ancestor, as little as um, one to three generations removed. If tracing back to the 1940 census, the millennials up through Gen Z need only identify a grandparent or great-grandparent and are within four to six generations of an enslaved ancestor. Um, next slide, please. So I, I believe, yes. 
And so the proving eligibility, one of three ways. The first is identifying an enslaved ancestor by name, and that's an African-American ancestor born in the South prior to 1865. The second is identifying an ancestor living in the United States prior to 1900. That is, African-American ancestor can live anywhere in the United States prior to the state because of the lack of voluntary African and Caribbean immigration to the United States. And the third is identifying an ancestor or family member, because we're talking about the 1940s, many of those people are still living today, living in the South prior to the Great Migration of 1940. And um, so if you go to the next slide, I demonstrate how to search for an enslaved ancestor using FamilySearch.org. Um, I used FamilySearch.org because it is a completely free site. They have over 8 billion records. And it is run by the Church of Latter-day Saints, which also has 5,000 in-person brick-and-mortar resource centers right across the country if you needed to get help tracing your lineage. So if you can begin the tutorial, I'd appreciate it. Um, thank you. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to take you through a brief tutorial on how to conduct this research yourself. And I have chosen FamilySearch.org, which is the completely free genealogy website that has over 8 billion records for you to choose from. So let's get started. Um, we'll go to Records. And I'm choosing my deceased grandmother, Mitty, as the example. Mitty, last name Morrow. She was born in Greene County, Alabama in 1919. Immediately, we are able to see that she shows up in the 1930 census living in Mantua, Green, Alabama, um, and her birth year is 1918. So she's 12 years old in this record, and what we want to do is find someone a little older than she is, even though this record would satisfy the eligibility requirements because um, she is living in the South prior to 1940, but let's go and view the original document. So down below it lists that she is um, a daughter in this household, which means that that is her relationship to the head of household, so we should expect to see a father. And I will expand this so that you can see the actual census record. And... Lo and behold, here is her father, Percy Morrow, listed as head of household. So since we found Percy, and let's look at some details about Percy. Oh, too far. Let's highlight him. So he is born 1896 in Alabama, and he's living in Mantua, Green County, Alabama. So we're going to put that in our next set of search criteria for Percy. Green County, 1896. Excellent. So the first record that shows up is Percy, except for it, it has his birthday as November 1894. Um, all of the birth dates are estimates at this point in history. So we see here that Percy is six years old in this record. And let's scroll down. And let's see. He is born in Alabama. The relationship to head of household is grandson. So we actually are able to go back in time and see someone who is possibly um, a member of uh, the freedom generation. Ah, we have grandmother here, Harriet Morrow. She is born October 1841. And let's see. And she's born in North Carolina. This shows that she has four living children and that she's been married for 25 years and that her both her mother and her father are also born in North Carolina. This record would actually serve to um, indicate that I descend from enslaved ancestry because here in the 1900 record, we didn't have to go back to 1870, we see that we bump into an enslaved ancestor, Harriet Morrow. 
and we know that she is enslaved because North Carolina is a slave state. She is black. She was born in 1841 in North Carolina, which um, we can pretty much assume that she was um, enslaved during that period of time. So that is our proof standard, but we will just look at the original record, open this up. Let's find them here. Let's see. Let's see. Down, down, down. And here she is. So Harriet Morrow is the head of household, and this is down, this is them down here. Harriet Morrow, his mother, her daughter Tealy, um, her son Lonnie, which is Percy's uncle, and his brother Eddie. So this is his household, and this record would prove that the family descends from American chattel slavery. Thank you. I can't hear you if you're speaking, Chair Moore. Okay, thank you for that presentation, Dr. Kelly Farish. So now we'll go to Dr. Antoinette Harrell. You have eight minutes, and in the interest of time, I will be timing you. So thank you, um, Dr. Antoinette Harrell, you may begin. Thank you. A, a rewarding hobby, some may say, genealogy, the second most popular hobby in America, according to an article in Time and U.S. Today. I personally disagree with Tony on this subject. Please allow me to state my personal reasons. I am a descendant of those that was held enslaved in America. My enslaved ancestors on my maternal side, as well as my father's side of the family, was held as slaves in Nancy, Mount Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Mississippi, and Louisiana. When slavery was abolished in America, many formerly enslaved people walked miles in search of their families. Mothers were searching for their children, husbands searching for their wife and their children. Many mothers lost their minds because they couldn't find their children. In 1994, I started researching my family tree, only to learn that I had to travel to those states with my family, look in search for my family, Traveling to those places came with a cost. The most important point that I want to make today is the amount of money it takes to conduct research, either researching for yourself or hiring a professional genealogy. There is a cost. The cost for travel, hotels, memberships to some genealogy databases, copies, equipment, a computer, cameras, etc. Those costs and fees that many would like to research their family history, but just can't afford to. 157 years later, I'm still searching for family members who were sold away from each other. Today, I still have trouble accessing records to do, accessing records due to what is called the gatekeepers of the records. Now, what are the gatekeepers of those records? In my 30 years of researching, some records are in the attics, some records are in state archives, which we do not have access to those records. In most places, there's not people that look like me that is in control of those records. For one moment, I will each of you to think about with parents, your siblings, and other family members being sold off, traded off, or auctioned off, never to see them again. You spend your life this that can ever repair the damages of breaking up families, the mental suffering my ancestors and others will and I just want to point out something very clear. Discuss should it be lineage based or should it be basically by the race? Some people will not be able to prove their family history. Courthouses have been burned when it comes down to the slavery records. Yes, we can use family search, ancestry, and other data, but some records are Hey, I still have difficulty 
retrieving those records away, away from people in America, their family history. Genealogy is important. Study reparations, consider funding to research their family history. It is a very, as I said, put the amount back together. There are purposes, but for the most part, many of them charges you to. You have you have one minute, and then there's some technical difficulty, so it's choppy. But you have a minute and a half. Just one out. That we can address these issues of how are we going up the. I mean, it is up. <laughs> yes, thank you, Dr. Harrell. So now we'll turn to the next person on our agenda, which is Tony Burroughs. Tony Burroughs, you may begin, and you have eight minutes, and I am timing. Thank you. Tony Burroughs, are you available? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, you may begin. Started your eight minutes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, I want to thank you, uh, Chairperson Moore, as well as the California Reparations Task Force, for inviting me here to speak on my favorite subject today. I also want to thank uh, Alicia Turner for the grunt work she has done. But more importantly, I want to thank Dr. Cheryl Grills for suggesting genealogists address the challenge of tracing African Americans into slavery. I don't have a lot of time, but I want to give you the 40,000 foot view of proving slave ancestry. Next. Genealogy is based on evidence. It's very similar to a court of law where a person dies without an estate. People have to bring in evidence to prove who's related to the deceased and how they're related to the deceased. And those rules in a court are very similar to the rules that we use in genealogy. We're trying to prove two things. The first thing we're trying to prove is identity. Is this our ancestor or is it merely someone with the same name as our ancestor? And when you look in these databases, they have thousands and thousands of names and many people with the same name. The other thing we're trying to prove is relationship. Is this your ancestor? And is this the person's father? Is this the person's mother? And do they have documentary evidence to prove that? So that's what we're trying to prove in genealogy. Next slide. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to start with ourselves and proceed back with one generation at a time to take us back to slavery 157 years ago. So that's 157 years of research that we must do to get back to slavery. We're talking about looking at oral history. No, could you go, all right, stay there, thank you. Uh, we're looking at oral history, we're looking at obituaries, we're looking at birth certificates, death certificates, census records, court records, church records, military records, and a multitude of other records. Next. We cannot assume who the slave owner was or who the enslaver was, because again, this is based on evidence. So we need evidence to prove who that person was. I was a consultant on the Reverend Al Sharpton's genealogy back in 2007. Al Sharpton's great grandfather, Coleman Sharpton, was enslaved in Liberty County, Florida. Next slide. This is a illustration of the 1860 Liberty County, Florida slave schedule. There's census schedules that were taken every 10 years. When you get to 1850 and 1860, they had slave schedules. But on that slave schedule, you find the name of the enslaver, but there are no names of enslaved people on there. There's only their ages, their sex, and their color. So 
the genealogists working on this said that this Jefferson Sharpton was Coleman's enslaver. I said without names on those slave schedules, you cannot prove who was enslaved. The slave schedules do not prove ownership. So the genealogists did further research. Jefferson Sharpton died shortly after the slave schedule was created, leaving debts. His father, Alexander Sharpton, lived in Edgefield, South Carolina. Alexander sent five of his enslaved people, including Coleman, to Florida to be hired out to pay off his son's debts. Next slide. This is the 1861 indenture for that transaction and proof that Alexander Sharpton was the owner and not Jefferson Sharpton. I also told the genealogists that segregationist Senator Strom Thurmond was also from Edgefield, South Carolina. The genealogists did more research and learned that Sharpton's ancestors were enslaved by Strom Thurmond's ancestors. This moved the story from page five to page one in the New York Daily News for five days in a row. It was the most read story on the internet. I was quoted in seven different newspapers around the world. This is what happens when we use evidence to prove genealogy. So what kind of evidence are we talking about? Next slide, please. Next slide. We're talking about things like slave narratives. Those were interviews done with formerly enslaved people. Here, Alex Woodard was owned by Johnny Simulton. Next slide. We can use Civil War pension files. Over 170,000 African Americans fought in the U.S. Civil War in the U.S. colored troops. Here, Thomas Upshaw had a pension application file and indicated that his mother was owned by Lewis Upshaw, but his dad was, was owned by another enslaver named Nelson. Next slide, please. The Freedmen's Bureau, which uh, Dr. Hollis Gentry mentioned earlier. The Freedmen's Bureau was a social service agency after the Civil War and had about a dozen different services for freedmen as well as refugees. Here is an 1866 labor contract where Samuel Littlejohn hired three men who he indicates that he formerly enslaved. Next slide. This is a Freedman Bank record. The Freedman's Bank, the Freedman Savings and Trust Association was a banking system after the Civil War for formerly enslaved people, as well as Civil War veterans. Here we have Thomas Armstrong said his master was William McIntosh. Next slide, please. Here we have manumission records. A manumission was when an owner or enslaver individually privately frees some of his enslaved individuals. These are found in the courthouse. These are only a few of a dozen other records that prove enslavement. Next slide. So we have many challenges. Next, what are some of the challenges? One, there's faulty oral history. We have stories that are passed down from generation to generation, and oftentimes they get changed in each generation. Next, most records are not online. The internet only has a tip of the iceberg of the billions of records that exist, and most people are not even aware of those records. Next, names of formerly enslaved people are often different than those of their last owner. They have a name of an owner, but it could go back generation. Next slide. Some people change their name. Some of them didn't, but some of them did, particularly those that were on the Underground Railroad to protect their identity. Next. Many names were spelled in many different ways. I found my name Burl spelled over 20 different ways. That's a real challenge in tracing your ancestors. Next. Some records did not survive. There were born courthouses, which was mentioned earlier. There were records that were thrown out, and there's records that were transferred, records that have been sitting in warehouses, and sometimes records are just hidden from view that people do not have access to. Next. This is not quick and easy research. 
It can be very laborious and very time consuming. Next slide. Genealogy is easy to start, but it's difficult to prove enslaved ancestors. Next slide. Unfortunately, most people do not have the genealogical skills and the knowledge of history to prove slave ancestry. Next slide. Thank you very much. I appreciate you offering me the opportunity to present this information, and I'd be more than happy to have any questions that you may have. Are you missing Chair Moore? Looks like we're missing Chair Moore and our Vice Chair. So could DOJ staff step in um, and help us get to the next? Right, right in there. I'm gonna take the speech. Oh, Vice Chair Brown, you're there. Can you help us move yeah, forward? Right. We can't hear you, Vice Chair Moore. I mean, um, Brown. Thank you. Um, sorry. Th this is this is Michael uh, Newman in the AG's office. Hello, oh, Chair Moore, coming back on. Chair Moore, we're ready for the next uh, person, Robin Simple. Thank you. Esteemed member. Would you like me to begin? Yes, I do. Okay, okay. Esteemed. Esteemed members of the Reparations Task Force, I am honored and thank you for inviting me to address this body as you consider the issue of reparations for the descendants of the formerly enslaved. I speak to you today as a family historian who has been researching since 19, a personal genealogist and holder from Boston University Metropolitan College's Certificate in Genealogical Research. I have completed and hold a certificate from Gene Proof Program, which prepares genealogists for board certification in genealogy and I'm a current graduate certificate candidate in forensic genetic genealogy at the Henry C. Lee College of Forensic Science at the University of New Haven. Perhaps the most, most importantly, I also come before you today as a descendant of the formerly enslaved. My personal research focuses on Virginia, southwestern Virginia, in fact, where the Blue Ridge Mountains control the skies. My client work has been broad but has almost exclusively focused on the descendants of the formerly enslaved from many states. I believe we may all agree that the harms done to the enslaved and their reverberating effects on generation after generation command a repair, a restitution on par with the damage done to all of those before and those who represent them today. It is my hope and objective to offer a genealogist view of the type of documentation of the formerly enslaved is available gaps we may encounter in recreating the lives of the formerly enslaved, and how we conduct this research according to the Board of Certification of Genealogists, BCG, Genealogical Proof Standard, known as the GPS. Next slide, please. You can go two slides ahead. These insights may enable this body to apply a specific threshold or proof standards of descendancy from the formerly enslaved that will allow the greatest number of descendants to meet the standard. Fueled by television programs such as Finding Your Roots, African American Lives, and African American Lives Two by Henry Louis Gate, his accompanying book In Search of Our Roots, How 19 Extraordinary African Americans Reclaim Their Past, and Who Do You Think You Are, an American genealogy documentary, there is a heightened enthusiasm for genealogy, historical novels, documentaries, television shows, um, and scholarly works that tell the stories of our ancestors, including, including those that examine the formerly enslaved. What is not so obvious in these polished and persuasive projects 
products is the extensive work required, the dead ends, and the frequent brick walls that descendants of the formerly enslaved often encounter along the way. Next slide, please. To recreate the lives of the formerly enslaved, we use many types of documents, including manifest, property records, wills and probate records, manumission and emancipation papers, and newspapers, all may mention our enslaved ancestors. Determining which combination of documents will produce the best results varies from state to state, family to family, and jurisdiction to jurisdiction. There are also several key collections for researching formerly enslaved Americans, including, but not limited to, the Freedman's Bureau, U.S. Colored Troops Military Service Records, U.S. African American Photo Collection, Cohabitation Registers, these collections complement the U.S. federal census records with which many are familiar. About the Freedmen's Bureau records. In the years following the Civil War, the Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen, and Abandoned Lands aided tens of thousands of former slaves. These records are undoubtedly among some of the most revealing about the formerly enslaved. Yet, proper identification of any individual including the formerly enslaved, requires careful correlation of many pieces of information, as in the case of a Reverend Lewis W. Holmes from Southwestern Virginia. My mother had known him as a girl, recounted many stories about her and her grandma's visits to his home for dinner after church. With the ready access of Ancestry.com, I quickly identified the Reverend in several U.S. federal censuses and a census of the Freedmen's Bureau. He was not, however, found in the 1870 U.S. Federal Census. Quick word about the uh, U.S. Colored Troops records. This database contains compiled military service records for the United States Colored Troops. Uh, we use this collection to discover additional details about the lives of the formerly enslaved. Next slide, please. Next slide. A word about the 1870 census. So as the debate rages as to who and how we should identify those eligible for reparations, many turn to the 1870 U.S. federal census as a reliable document to identify the formerly enslaved. The 1870 census was the first census to provide detailed information on the African-American population only a few years after the Civil War and emancipation. It enumerated over 4.8 million African-Americans at the time. For those who have enough information to identify and find their ancestors in 1870, the U.S. federal census of that year is invaluable. There are, however, many descendants who cannot get back that far. Next slide, please. I think I've gotten out of sync with my slides. This is a uh, document that I wanted to show which is a different kind of document. Lewis W. Holmes, the reverend that I mentioned, actually was uh, forced was forced to work for the Confederacy as a child and apply for a U.S. federal, uh, U.S. Confederate pension. We don't have time to go into the story, but it is a very interesting story and the outcome is as well. But I'd like to share the case of a client with whom I worked during the summer of 2018. She had known her grandfather, who was born about 1877 in Petersburg, Virginia. She nor her relatives knew his parents' names or locations, which quickly became the focus of my research on her behalf. Her grandfather, by virtue of his age, would not have been enumerated on the 1870 U.S. Federal Census, but the thought was that parents would live. Several documents were identified for her grandfather, including a few which provided his parents' names. Unfortunately, they had first names that were very common, coupled with surnames that were highly prevalent in the region, names such as Peter Smith and Mary Jones. Next slide, please. For this client, and many like her, a threshold of identifying her ancestor in the 1870 census might prohibit participation in a reparations program. So this is an 1870 census which actually has the, uh, my great grandfather, who was three months old at the time of the census. So I happen to be fortunate that at least set of my great grandparents are enumerated in 1870, but there are many people in our community 
for whom this would be a tall task. So I think I'm a, I'm a little bit ahead of my slides. Next slide. Um, Do you have a minute? Next have one slide. Minute. Thank you. This is an important consideration if the federal census is to be the main threshold for participation in the reparations program. The truth of the matter is for descendants of the formerly enslaved, it will take a correlation of several documents to prove their ancestors' identities. Lastly, I'd like to say, let us ensure that each applicant meets the genealogical proof standard which says that we do reasonably exhaustive research, complete and accurate source citations. Next slide, please. Thorough analysis and correlation, resolution of conflicting, next slide, evidence and soundly written conclusions, next slide, based on the strongest evidence possible. I encourage this body to consider a broad threshold for participation in a reparations remedy. Thank you again for inviting me and I look forward to the recommendations of this task force as you lead the way for the nation. Thanks so much, Dr. Simple. So now we'll go to Dr. Greg Carr. Begin. Can you uh, give me chair? Chair Moore? Sounds like I have some can I uh, can I be heard? All right, yeah. I'm going to continue. Hopefully, that echo will go away. Looks like yeah. it's gone away. Thank you. Um, thank you for the invitation, and thank you for the opportunity to uh, to speak as a son of Africans enslaved in the United States, in Alabama, North Carolina, and Tennessee. I'll call the name of my mother's grandparents. Uh, Peter Hayes and Mabby Hayes, North Carolina and Alabama, respectively. While migration, and, and what I'm about to say really isn't new, I'm just adding my voice to those calling for creative ways to approach specific questions of eligibility. Uh, while migration is a central theme in human history, violent, modern, forced migrations as the consequence of settler colonialism provide direct source and context for the modern world systems of nation states. Global, regional, national, and local obligations and efforts to address and remedy ongoing effects of harm against specific groups deprived of natural and human resources by these serial forced migrations present discrete polities with an opportunity to model a wide variety of repair methods. Consequently, the United States State of California Task Force to Study and Develop Reparations Proposal for African Americans may find it useful to consider the following four broad assertions pursuing especially to considering defining eligibility beyond race and lineage, which of course carries on uh, its own particular problems of relying on record keeping among other things by those who had us enslaved and not even as human until the mid 19th century is another point of departure for exploring reparative relief for descendants of Africans for whom group identity as African captives begins as described in section 8301.1B1A and section 8301A3 uh, with their capture and procurement on the African continent. And that second section I referred to refers to African citizenship rights, which of course is something that had to be back mapped in history as a legal concept as we know, if we were to take that route. So here are the four um, kind of broad assertions I wanna make in brief. Number one, demands for and questions of reparations have been raised since before the transformation of Western settler colonies into settler states as a challenge to undertake structural, modern social transformation. The essential guiding question at all levels of policy provided repair is, quote, how do we decolonize the modern world, end quote. Especially when the harm being redressed predates the imposition of today's state borders. Enslavement was illegal at the time that it was going on, of course, and remedies will require organized international networks of will that shape law to will in their specific contexts. And California would be no different in that regard. Number two, questions of race and or lineage have cultural, social, and political definitions that are best addressed by studying how they intersect with, influence, and interact with legal definitions, and also how they function beyond specific legal definitions and broader historical frameworks. Therefore, popular legal notions of race and lineage are inadequate tools 
for tracing group-based harm. Number three, the racial category of black, as used in the modern world system, emerges directly out of the process of Western or white colonialism that established black as coterminous with coterminous rather with fluid, racialized, unfree labor regimes, thereby establishing the eligibility category for redressing a global harm through varied local repair efforts. Accordingly, black merely parrots the paradigm of colonialism and is inappropriate for any effort to aiming to decolonize the modern world. And then finally, number four, polities, country level, regional, state level, local, municipal level, repair efforts should not automatically preclude any other form of remedy. U.S. state-based efforts, cognizant of the undermining of racially categorized remedies in federal and state law, and I know California, y'all no stranger to that, may find a creative point of entry for proposed remedies by applying to California residents of African descent an overarching concept that recognizes the singularly unique circumstances that made enslavement and blackness virtually coterminous allowing a legal status more akin under federal and state constitutional law to date to that enjoyed by Native Americans and other discrete groups of immigrants from other sovereign polities. In other words, recipients of California's repair efforts should suffer no preclusive impact. Now I'll take the last couple of minutes to kind of go back over those very briefly. Not, uh, the first uh, issue I raised of the four, especially when we're talking about harm, that uh, the redress for harm that predates the imposition of today's borders, you know, when we read Martin Luther King, chapters four and five of where do we go from here, chaos or community, uh, he traces the status of black people in the United States and elsewhere to European attacks on the African continent. And he proposes uh, reparations in the form of educational employment rights and uh, civil rights and human rights and housing. He proposes them in the context of structural reforms that will aid black people, but are not exclusive to black people. That does not preclude uh, specific remedies for black people, but it does uh, begin to gesture toward, even as he wrote, wrote this in 1968, shortly before he was assassinated, it does preclude what had already begun to emerge as an attack on rights-based remedies. Of course, 68 is, what, half a decade before Baki. Uh, we certainly see the turn back, and, and, and it, doesn't, it doesn't have us relying on that, uh, that 1938 famous footnote for Carlene Products notion of minorities. In other words, trying to get away from that concept because we know that the legal challenges will be coming whenever it's proposed. Number two, just uh, briefly as a kind of wind to conclusion, using popular legal notions of race and lineage would be inadequate uh, in, in, in many ways because they rely on the same field of violence that created the harm in the first place. Uh, we look at Howard French's recent book, Born in Blackness, where he traces how you, you know, the French and the Dutch, the Spanish, the Portuguese, they're not the same people, but collectively they all treated the very different peoples of Africa as one people. That, that, that's where the creation was created. Colonialism is the point of departure, not enslavement. Enslavement directs the standing practice to the site of the continuing harm, not the original harm. And what if we can reposition that, we can address local harm through policymaking in an in a, in a international and regional network. And in that regard, uh, Chair Moore, in particular, your work, I know you're no stranger to some of those arguments, having done work uh, beyond the United States and seeing how we can think creatively in tandem and apply uh, solutions in different places in the world to our local challenges. Uh, finally, and I'll just go through three and four very quickly. I've got my eye on the clock and I realize I've been talking about seven minutes. Accordingly, the, the third of the four points I, I raised, how blackness in many ways parrots the paradigm of colonialism. Uh, Ira Berlin, who was quoted earlier, uh, he, he did another series of talks at Harvard and he published them in a book called The Long Emancipation, Demise of Slavery in the United States, where he makes the argument that enslavement in many ways is an asymmetrical war that never had a truce created. And Mario Bedelli makes a similar point in his work where he says, you know, you never ask black people what they wanted. Citizenship was extended to us in the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment, the Reconstruction Era amendments, but there was no, uh, there was no, there was no poll of black people. That, that, that's impossible. Well, then the question then becomes, how do we start talking about a group harm when the group itself is constantly shifting? The solution to that would be to construct that group not based on legal arguments within the context of specific areas where we've been harmed, but rather to construct that group almost like a class, construct that class before the creation of the state formations we are now seeking redress from. 
that might obviate the need for a kind of race-based solution that would certainly not be sustained in the federal courts. Um, I'm, hey, I'm sorry, one more, I'm sorry, Madam Chair. I didn't hear you. My timer went off, just telling you. Then your timer went off, which means I'm going to stop talking and see if anybody has any questions. <laughs> thank you for you. Sir. Thank you. We'll get to questions at the end. So thank you, Dr. Carr. We'll now hear from Je Jessica Ann Mitchell Ayuar. You have eight minutes. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Can you? Okay. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to speak before this historic task force. My name is Jessica Ann Mitchell Iwuyor. I'm a descendant of Africans that were enslaved in Georgia and South Carolina. The oldest known ancestor on my maternal side is John Hamilton, born in 1853, and his wife Delaney, born in 1857, both designated as mulattoes in the 1880 U.S. Census and Black in later census records. Their granddaughter, Flossie Hamilton, is my maternal great-grandmother. When she married my great-grandfather, George Wilder, slavery had been abolished. However, like many other African Americans living in the South, Flossie and George were not allowed to live freely due to the oppressive system of sharecropping that made many black families indebted and criminalized for seeking to leave. So they fled in the middle of the night with their children to Augusta, Georgia, where most of my maternal family resides today. I bring up their story because it highlights two significant factors of importance concerning community of eligibility, lineage and harms. For reparative justice, both lineage and harm should be considered with special prioritization towards harm-based reparations, concerning lineage and special consideration to direct descendants. Lineage is important to reparations discourse because our lineage was subjected to ongoing terror and systemic oppression. However, the concept of lineage should not be limited to the system of chattel slavery. This limited description minimizes and erases the historical, ethnic, and cultural identities of our ancestors and ourselves, which is essential for understanding and identifying the harmed communities. African Americans are a mixture of descendants of various African ethnic groups. Over time, these shared experiences, cultural fusion, and combined progeny, African Americans became an ethnic group through the process, process of ethnogenesis. And we are part of a larger ethnic identity consisting of the greater African diaspora with other Africans that endured the transatlantic slave trade and merged identities in the Western world also through ethnogenesis. These expansive ethnic identities, though more recently affirmed and identified, emerged before the formation of the United States and continued forming following the construction of the United States as various African ethnic groups continued combining and creating communities during and after the transatlantic slave trade. This expansive ethnic categorization is often referred to as African descendants, Afro descendants, and or people of African descent institutionalized and officially recognized by the United Nations. The Durban Declaration Program of Action adopted at the 2001 World Conference Against Racism, Racial Discrimination, Xenophobia, and Related Intolerance also has an ongoing working group of experts on people of African descent. Understanding people of African descent as a special category and African Americans as an ethnic group among this category of transatlantic slave trade survivors is a critical factor in better understanding lineage and how to navigate potential issues concerning race-based and race-neutral legislation. Concerning the community of eligibility, Black immigrants and Black American migrants, reparations should be implemented through a streamlined non-invasive approach that gives as many African Americans the opportunity to receive remedies as possible. Strict mechanisms of approval that would force families to take DNA tests or endure extensive genealogical background searches should be avoided. This would be an invasive, time-consuming, and costly strategy that potentially excludes families that refuse to submit DNA or refuse genealogical background searches. Furthermore, the assertion that everyone can or will trace this ancestry independently does not account for accessibility and or disability issues. Many who disagree with limiting eligibility to the enslavement era do not disagree in order to dilute or harm African-American justice claims, but to protect it. Specifically, in the case of Black Californians, much attention has been given to the question of Black immigrants, and not enough attention has been given to the descendants of Black American migrants from Southern states. 
The majority of black immigrants arrived in California within the last 50 to 30 years and are therefore easily distinguishable regarding qualifications for reparations for chattel slavery if California were to take a tiered harms-based approach. On the other hand, black American Californians face their own uphill battle concerning limiting eligibility to chattel slavery. Many black Americans in California are in fact not descendants of persons enslaved within the state of California. Instead, many are descendants of persons enslaved in Southern states, such as Texas, Georgia, Arkansas, Louisiana, et cetera. Their families later migrated to California during the, the Great Migration from 1910 to 1970, especially during the following, during and following World War II. Suppose eligibility was limited only to the enslavement era. In that case, the state of California could likely decide only to provide reparations for black Californians that can provide proof of descendancy from persons enslaved within the state. This would be the next logical step and not a far-fetched scenario. And in this case, many African-American Californians would not qualify for reparations in California. However, by recognizing reparations as inclusive of the era of enslavement, the U.S. apartheid system and ongoing systemic racism, African-American Californians would be safely protected and covered under reparations initiatives and eligibility claims. Concerning harms. In 1951, the Civil Rights Congress published We Charge Genocide, the historic petition to the United Nations for relief from a crime of the United States against the Negro people, asserting that the United States violated the UN Genocide Convention. Current day reparations advocates like Nikichi Taifa have also declared that the harms endured by people of African descent in the United States fit the definition of genocide according to the International Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. Taifa even coined the term institutional genocide as a framework through which to analyze the evolving jurisprudence of international human rights doctrine to selected conditions impacting Black people in the United States. The World Conference Against Racism additionally declare, declared slavery and the slave trade crimes against humanity. The harms that our ancestors experienced and their descendants experienced are more than about lost wages or the racial wealth gap. They care, they are about our civil and human rights. They are about the vestiges of the historic government sanctioned violence against people of African descent and the systemic oppression that after slavery also made us victims of mass incarceration and prevented us from access to housing, healthcare, education, and banking. Thus, to fully close the door on the horrific chapter in history, reparations should not be limited to the era of enslavement or eligibility, but should be or sh and should not be limited to proof of lineage during the period of eligibility for harms against people of African descent. It must also include U.S. apartheid system and the ongoing systemic racism. The eligibility for harms against people of African descent in the United States was ongoing and very inclusive. Thus, the remedies must be ongoing and inclusive or we risk extending the injuries instead of repairing them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now we will turn to Marcus Champion. Marcus Champion, you may begin your testimony. You have a PowerPoint. Uh, can you guys see me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Hear you and I and we see your presentation. All right. Good afternoon, Chair Moore, Vice Chair Brown, Task Force members, and a happy one-year-old birthday to my youngest baby girl, Zuri. Today, I want to briefly go over my me and my team's involvement in helping shape the AB 3121 legislation that is responsible for the task force you occupy today and also reemphasize the importance of a lineage standard and its place in the legislation through the process. I want to recognize my sister Tiffany Quarles because it was she who sent out the call to action in March 2019 to organize politically. It was then many of us decided to get off the internet and get active in the political process, play a part in influencing our own destiny. Next slide. We had a few meetings and conducted our first town hall to educate the community on the need for lineage specific reparations. After the town hall, we formed our first board of what is now known today as NAASDLA. From there, our organizing extended across the state, forming associations with groups from Northern California to San Diego, a coalition that is now known as CJEC. Next slide. 
our first order of business was becoming aware of AJR 21, a resolution by Assemblywoman Dr. Shirley Weber that required California to apologize for its complicity in enabling and furthering the practice of slavery. Next slide. Shortly after came ACR 130, again by Dr. Weber that recognized the need to pursue the avenues of reparations. Next slide. AB 3121 was introduced into the CA legislature in February 2020. We secured a meeting with Dr. Weber a month later in March. I need everyone to understand we do this for real, so in studying reparations leg legislation, we realize, next slide, AB 3121 in its original form was a rewrite of HR 40, originally HR 3745 with California specifics added to it. Next slide. HR 40 was a reimagining re of S 1647, the Commission on Wartime Relocation and Internment of Civilians Act, also known as Redress for Japanese Americans. Next slide. AB 3121 contained the same language as HR 40 that identified the eligible party as simply African American. This made sense for the Honorable John Conyers to frame this bill this way in 1989 because, next slide, as a 2015 Pew Research study shows, the percentage of the U.S. black population that was foreign born in 1980 was 3.1% and had only risen to 4.9% in 1990. So the title African-American referred to a specific type of person at the time with a specific lineage. Because of this, we, we thought we were going into the Dr. Weber meeting to make a case for our, and our, make our case and explain to her the importance of lineage specificity. We did, but it was really unnecessary because Dr. Weber was already there. And recently in the January task force meeting, now Secretary of State Dr. Shirley Weber shared her passion for the need of not just reparations, but lineage specific reparations. We began meeting on a weekly basis directly after our initial meeting to identify areas where we felt we could improve the legislation. Dr. Weber's office agreed to review our amendments in the May meeting. The problem was this meeting was midday on a Tuesday and the next committee in the legislature was reviewing the bill that Thursday morning so we had less than 48 hours to not only submit the amendments, but submit them in a way that would pass legislative council because we didn't have the time needed to do revisions if necessary. Next slide. I wanna pause here and get everyone to understand we aren't polit politicians or professional political staffers. We are regular people who decide to come outside and get active in real life, not the internet. We don't get paid in any way. We spend our own, own money to get things done. So in reality for the last three years, we all have been operating at a net negative financially when it comes to this cause. We do this because we all believe in the justice of reparations. The philosopher Irmi Osei Frimpong asked a question I stand by. Would you rather have a few wealthy black folks or a stable middle-class black community? Being a product of Inglewood and South Central LA in the late 80s and 90s, I'm blessed to survive the times. And it's because of this, I will put everything in my being to seeing the stable black community across the nation and that is facilitated by reparations. Back to the legislation. We had a time crunch, no margin of error, and no expertise in the field to ensure this would get done. Next slide. By this time, after meeting weekly, we had crafted nine amendments, but we needed guidance to make sure we got this right. So my wife tapped into a former colleague who was a lobbyist and was familiar with generally how legislation should be crafted. Originally, originally our language read American descendants of slavery, but it was quickly realized that term had zero legal precedent and would be thrown out immediately. He insisted African-American had to be part of the language, but unlike in 1989, this term is now used as an umbrella term for anyone who is black with American citizenship. So we worked through terms to make it more specific to the proper community of eligibility. It was here we came up with African-Americans who are descendants of persons enslaved in the United States. Again, I am just a citizen, but understanding the urgency of the moment, I researched how to properly edit a bill, striking old language, adding new, et cetera, and went through AB 3121, adding in our nine amendments where they made the most sense. My brother, Chris Lodson, took what I had done afterwards and put the finishing touches on it, but we wanted to make sure. So I reached out to a friend from college who was a who's in the political sphere, and she connected us with a legislative slash policy consultant. The consultant agreed that American descendants of slavery had no precedent and would not work and gave us notes related to our other amendments. We made the necessary changes and submitted our amended version of AB 3121 to Dr. Weber's office. Everything I just stated happened over the course of about 12 hours. That Thursday morning, Dr. Weber's office told us they would keep two of our amendments. Next slide. 
and that is the identified eligible party African Americans who are descendants of persons enslaved in the United States, as well as Article 6, Section 8301.5, that reads any state level reparations actions that are undertaken as a result of this chapter are not a replacement for any reparations enacted at the federal level and shall not be interpreted as such. Of course, we were ecstatic because we've been working hard for this, but we also understood this was just the beginning. Chris Lodson and I were later tapped by Dr. Weber's office to provide expert testimony for one of AB 3121's hearings. Everybody who knows me knows well I don't need the spotlight and there's no problem for me to do what's necessary for the greater good. I took a step back to allow my brother of almost two decades, Dr. Kenjis Watson, to take my place and give testimony and Chris graciously gave up his spot to another individual who we thought could provide the best testimony at the time. I have to reiterate that the greater good trumps my feelings and my ego. It's about the end goal, period. Next slide. In August, the bill was amended, adding with special consideration language to the community of eligibility. After lots of scrambling and many conversations, we learned from Dr. Weber directly that she made the change herself to ensure the descendants of free blacks were not excluded. We remained in the process even after passing the legislature. Tiffany Quarles tapped Congresswoman Maxine Waters and Ice Cube to put pressure on Governor Newsom to sign the legislation because he waited until the very last day. Next slide. I also have to recognize Tiffany for leaning on the governor's office to do a public signing ceremony, ceremony for this historic action that many of us attended. Next slide. In closing, I want to reiterate that the standard is a lineage standard. And this is a message directly to my Pan-African brothers and sisters. The world at large has committed atrocities against us through time, but that does not take away our responsibility, the responsibility I owe to myself, my people, and my ancestors to do things the right way. It would be an injustice on my part to let my feelings get in the way of what is just, what is logical, and what is legal. Historical precedent, whether it was Japanese redress or Holocaust reparations, all have the same thing in common. A narrow scope of community of eligibility was identified in initial legislation. As clarified on pages 274 and 406 of Pablo de Grief's Handbook of Reparations, adjacent groups, whether it was Japanese Peruvians who were interned by the U.S. or people of Jewish descent who suffered outside of Germany during the Holocaust, found success with subsequent legislation and legal action. Dean of Berkeley Law, Erwin Chemerinsky, the foremost constitutional scholar possibly in the world testified before this body and indicated the standard should be a lineage standard because a race standard will violate Proposition 209 and the 14th Amendment. Feelings are not facts, but the fact is your feelings of trying to reshape this into a race standard will ensure that the history books record your names as the people who selfishly orchestrated the failure of reparations for the African-American descendants of persons enslaved in the United States because they chose their feelings and ideology over what was legal, logical, and just. Next slide. My father was from Tyler, Texas. My mother is from New Smyrna Beach, Florida. In a single afternoon during a FamilySearch.org workshop at their Los Angeles location, I was able to trace two strands of my family back to the 1840s including a great, great, great grandfather who fought in the Civil War. I'm just about done. I categor categorically reject the disrespect and insult conveyed by groups like Narcan and Cobra who routinely reduce the bedrock people and backbone of the United States, the African-American descendants of persons enslaved in the United States, as nothing more than a small group. You are a disappointment and disrespectful to your ancestors, but it's cool. We are here to step in and complete the mission. This body is not the place to solve racism in America. This body is tasked with delivering reparations in California. Make the eligibility standard a lineage standard today. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Marcus Champion. So the next to last speaker is Mike Davis. Mike Davis is a former state assembly member and currently works for the Board of Public Works after representing the 48th district, South Los Angeles and Koreatown, Wilshire area, from 2006 to 2012, he served as a vice chair of the California Legislative Black Caucus and also chaired the Select Committee on Rail Transportation. Mike Davis, you may begin your testimony. Can you hear me? Mike Davis. Yes, sir. Oh, you can. Uh, thank you so very much. I want to uh, commend 
Governor Ga uh, Gavin Newsom for signing the uh, measure to have this uh, commission and certainly Secretary of State Shirley Weber uh, and the entire committee, uh, all of those of you uh, as distinguished citizens who have conducted this discussion, which I find to be very intriguing and welcoming. Uh, my position in terms of should African Americans who are descendants of slaves be entitled to reparations is simply yes, absolutely. When I look not only at lineage and how critically important it is, I do recognize how difficult it would be that some people might have some difficulty in terms of being able to quickly identify uh, their lineage. But however, uh, the bad cannot be uh, the all end all and be all for all of be able to make that connection. And certainly I agree with many of the experts who have testified here today that we need to have a broad uh, perspective in terms of uh, providing assistance and including many individuals that we know that they are not from somewhere else. And we know the pathology in this country of African-Americans in the African-American experience. When I look at very briefly today's lineage conceptualization versus the environment we're in with Proposition 209, that effectively limited education, government jobs, and specifically contracting, which is the tool to put a shot in the arm of the economy of families and communities. How in fact it limited the opportunities for African-Americans to participate in publicly funded programs. And so lineage in fact is the concept that allows us to be able to more effectively deal with Proposition 209. And in every city, I'm from Los Angeles, in every city and county, we deal with Proposition 209. We are often told and remind, reminded that it says that there should not be preferences for women and for uh, people based upon race. But we are very rarely told that 209 also says uh, under Section 32, uh, Article 1A, it says first and foremost, if you look at the analysis of it, that you cannot discriminate based upon people, based upon race and gender. But we are not told that as often. And so when we look forward to creating an opportunity and an environment and a culture where there is truly equal protection of the law for publicly funded programs, and particularly uh, programs such as public contracting. It's the lineage that will allow us to truly navigate and get the right opportunities that we so rightfully deserve in publicly funded programs. Because through looking at lineage, we're not talking about race. We're not talking about gender. And the other unique and peculiar phenomenon in terms of how we count census is that we count race, Asians, African-Americans, but then we count Latinos, which is also a culture. A Latino can be as dark as I am, or they can be as light as Tom Hanks, because we put culture in counting the census along with race. In my final analysis, for us to create an opportunity in this state of California, in this very great and uh, uh, path uh, binding discussion on reparations, as we consider this, as California has a, a heritage and a legacy of shaping policy in America, let us do so with the understanding that we can make a difference when we look at what the facts are in terms of the action that has been most adverse to the growth and developments of African Americans in this country, and that is the institution of slavery. And so I conclude by saying to you that I am 100% in support of the great work that has been done by all of those of you who are on this commission, and that the question that you have before you
is should African Americans who are descendants of slaves be entitled to reparations? Even here in California, the country's most multicultural community. And in that, we've had many public policies that have accommodated people from various places, uh, from various stations in the country and in the world. And so we cannot shy away from the great opportunities that African Americans, those who were formerly enslaved, should rightfully be entitled to. These are publicly funded projects. And yet today's situation that limits us is a policy that came straight out of the state of California, Proposition 209. And I finally say that, as Dr. King has said many times, and again, through recordings that we have heard after his death, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And so I support this commission. I think it is a dynamic, a very welcoming uh, discussion on public policy. And I'm confident that African Americans who have been formerly enslaved and have the lineage to it and the thousands that can prove it deserve to have justice. And for those who might have some difficulty, they deserve to have assistance to connect that socket to the plug and making a difference because we know that they didn't come from somewhere else. They came from here. And eventually with a broad based concept, we can create the kind of justice that everyone deserves. Thank you so much for giving me an opportunity to give some brief remarks today. Thank you, Dr. Davis. So the last speaker that we'll hear from is Kevin Brown. Kevin Brown is a director of policy, advocacy, and legislative affairs at Safer Foundation, which is one of the nation's largest nonprofits working tirelessly to disrupt the cycle of recidivism and social justice in society. Kevin Brown, you may begin. I don't see Kevin's name on the call, um, actually. <clears throat> yeah, this is Michael uh, Newman in the in the DOJ, and he's not on the list, and we've not been able to uh, to connect um, to make sure he's on the uh, on the call. So uh, I defer to you as to whether you want to move on to uh, agenda item number nine or um, continue to try to reach out. We can move on. It's fine. Um, okay. So we can go to agenda item number nine. Okay. So the next item on the agenda um, is the discussion amongst the task force members about the community of eligibility. Um, is Dr. Brown back on the call, Vice Chair Brown? Uh, no, Dr. Brown um, communicated that he, oh, maybe he is. Okay, he is. Okay, so can okay. So to begin the discussion, I prepared um, a presentation, a PowerPoint, which shouldn't take more than uh, 15 minutes to complete, and I'll you know expedite that as much as possible. So, um, the DOJ, can you please pull up the, uh, the presentation, please? Thank you. Sorry, I think Trini is bringing it up right now. Okay, great, I see it. Okay, so if I see it, I think everyone should see it. So I'm gonna time myself. So I created this presentation to um, guide our discussion. So we heard from the public, we heard from the panelists, and now we have to decide amongst ourselves. So this is a statutory analysis of the bill AB 3121 as written. That's also informed by legislative history um, and other factors. You can go to the next slide. 
So essentially, I'm making the argument that the legislative history of AB 3121 and by extension HR 40 is inherently lineage specific. And then I'll point to actual statutory provisions that um, demonstrate that AB 3121 is lineage specific. Um, Secretary Weber's legislative intent uh, demonstrates a lineage specific intent. I'll also briefly go over the history of reparations advocacy as it pertains to the institution of slavery to, de to demonstrate that that movement has been lineage specific. Also, U.S. constitutional law, as prescribed by the um, insight from Dr. Uh, Chemerinsky, uh, demonstrates a lineage specific um, model for reparations for the institution of slavery. And then I'll also talk a bit about international law, including the Genocide Convention and Guarantees of Non-Repetition. And again, I have a Master of Laws from the University of Amsterdam on international criminal law. Um, next slide. <laughs> So let's first talk about the legislative history. So oftentimes administrative law experts, when they want to figure out what exactly does a bill entail or what, what it, what's it, its intended beneficiaries, they'll look at the legislative history. They'll see what was going on in the world during the time that the statute was enacted. So in order to first understand the legislative history and context about AB 3121, and I think Marcus Champion hinted at it, you have to start in 1988. When the Civil Liberties Act of 1988 was passed, which was a federal law that granted reparations to Japanese Americans who had been interned by the United States government during World War II. Because the law was restricted to American citizens and to legal permanent residents, ethnic Japanese who had been taken from their homes in Latin America, mostly from Peru, were not covered in the reparations, regardless of whether they had remained in the United States had returned to Latin America or had been deported to Japan after the war. Also, the white wives or spouses of these Japanese American internment victims were also not given repair. And if you talk to any Japanese American person who was a part of the redress campaign, they'll also state that HR 40, which was initially introduced by John Conyers in the late 80s, was uh, modeled after the lineage specific Japanese American redress bill. So we'll move on to December 19th, 1988, when Jesse Jackson held a press release, I mean, a press conference declaring that the black community wanted to be considered African Americans and not black, right? No later than a month after Jesse Jackson held that press release in December 1988, the late U.S. Congressman John Conyers introduces H.R. 40, again, no less than a month after Jesse Jackson's news conference, declaring that African-American was the terminology that they wanted to use to prescribe to Black Americans descendants of child slavery. Also, it should be noted, according to official reports, over 50 percent of Caribbean foreign-born people in the United States arrived to the United States after 1990 at least one year after the late Congressman Conyers initially introduced H.R. 40. Also, according to official reports, almost half of the African foreign-born population in the United States arrived after 2000, nearly 11 years after Congressman Conyers initially introduced H.R. 40. Also, as Marcus Champion noticed, noted, AB 3121 is a carbon copy of H.R. 40, but for the additional lineage specific information or terminology terminology that they introduce, which is a special consideration language, which Shirley Weber, sorry, Secretary Weber, noted in, in the task force hearing in January that they included that special consideration language to acknowledge the contributions of free blacks and formerly enslaved Africans prior to both groups official recognition of US citizenship via the 14th Amendment. So essentially my argument is that HR 40, which is a federal reparations bill, and by extension AB 3121 are lineage specific bills. They do not include reference to black Americans of immigrant origin by virtue of many missing key terms in the duty section and in the legislative findings and declarations section, including but not limited to Caribbean, West Indian, African foreign born, or even global black diaspora, which is explicitly referred to in NARC's $3 million MacArthur Foundation grant. 
and other keywords that would infer that HR 40 and AB 3121 are intended to include any other group aside from the descendants of free Blacks and formerly enslaved Africans. Next slide. So next slide. So there's many statutory provisions that I cited, but in the interest of time, I'll just cite um, a few of them. So the first statutory provision I'll cite is the first legislative finding, which says more than 4 million Africans and their descendants were enslaved in the United States and the colonies that became the United States from 1619 to 1865 inclusive. So at the outset, the first finding in the statute outlines the intended agreed population which is more than 4 million enslaved Africans and their descendants. So these people came to be known as American freedmen after March 3rd, 1865, when President Abraham Lincoln signed a bill creating the Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen and Abandoned Lands. Known as the Freedmen's Bureau, this federal agency oversaw the difficult transition of African Americans or freed African slaves and their descendants as defined in the statute from slavery to freedom. Next slide. So that's an original picture from the U.S. Senate archives of President Abraham Lincoln signing the bill that created the Freedmen's Bureau. Next slide. Um, the next uh, provision that I want to talk about is in the duty section of AB 3121. It mandates the task force to document and examine facts related to the following federal and state laws that discriminated against formerly enslaved Africans and their descendants who were deemed U.S. citizens from 1868 to present. So this statutory provision is lineage specific. It is mandating or requiring the task force to study and examine federal and state laws that discriminated, discriminated against a particular and distinct group of people. Who were those people? Formerly enslaved Africans and their descendants, who are also described as African-Americans or American freedmen as a distinct historical and political identifier who were deemed U.S. citizens from 1868 to present, which implicitly refers to the 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which was ratified by U.S. Congress in 1868. Um, this particular provision does not require the task force to document or examine discriminatory federal or state laws for any other group, and more particularly for any other group on the basis of race or skin color. Next slide. Um, this corroborates with scholars like Martha S. Jones, who created the book Birthright Citizens, that talks about how African Americans, through learning and studying the law, securing allies, conducting themselves like citizens, um, argued that their birth on United States soil guaranteed their rights. So this book essentially shows how the 14th Amendment constitutionalized the birthright principle fulfilling the long-held aspirations of African Americans. And that is why this particular statutory provision cites 1868 to acknowledge um, free Blacks and enslaved Africans all becoming citizens at one particular time. And that was in 1868 by virtue of the ratification of the uh, 14th Amendment. Next slide. So again, I'm not going to go through all the statutory provisions, but there's a few more that I would like to hit on. The next point is about, uh, no, we can move on. It's, this is saying the same thing, same, same thing. Next slide. Okay, wait, no, go back, go back. This is what I want to talk about. So there has been a lot of conversation about in this task force about which groups are particularly impacted by the lingering negative effects of the institution of slavery. Is it the direct descendants of enslaved Africans in the United States, for instance, or is it all black Californians by virtue of race or skin color? So this particular statutory provision in the duty section of the statute mandates the task force to study and document and examine facts related to the lingering negative effects of the institution of slavery and the matters described in this section, particularly on living African Americans who are descendants of persons enslaved in the United States and on society in the United States. So this particular provision is lineage specific, and it's requiring that the task force study the lingering negative effects of slavery specifically on a particular group of people. And the term society necessarily is race neutral. Next slide. Um, okay, again, the statutory provision states the same thing. 
The task force is required to study and develop reparations proposals for African Americans as a result of de jure and de facto discrimination against who? The statute verbatim, very clear, and said against freed slaves and their descendants from the end of the Civil War to the present, including economic, political, educational, and social discrimination. So while this task force is mandated to study and develop reparations proposals for contemporary or present day harms, such as redlining, educational discrepancies, predatory financial practices, economic, political, educational, and social discrimination, the statute clearly outlines such recognition is limited to freed African slaves and their descendants who became um, citizens um, after the Civil War by virtue of the 14th Amendment. Next slide, please. We're going to move on. As I will bring, uh, one, one, one comment I want to say about this, um, there are some other slides in the presentation that talk about why the statute references the term living African Americans. Next slide, I'll discuss it afterwards. Next slide. Okay, um, this slide, yes, this slide. Now, this is, a, this is a statutory provision that talks about the apology that the task force has to um, draft, right? And let's look at what it says verbatim. The task force shall address, among other issues, all of the following, how the state of California will offer a formal apology on behalf of the people of California for the perpetuation of gross human rights violations and crimes against humanity on African slaves and their descendants. So under international law, the apology is a symbolic form of reparations and it governs the universe of the subsequent material reparations to follow. So this statutory provision is quite clear on who the state of California has to apologize to. It has to apologize uh, to particularly African slaves and their descendants. This statutory provision is not requiring the task force to off or the California by virtue of the task force to offer a formal apology on behalf of all black Californians on the basis of race or skin color. It's requiring the task force to draft an apology for a specific crime against humanity on African slaves and their descendants, which are African Americans who descend from persons enslaved in the United States. Uh, next slide. We will move on in the interest of time. Next slide. Um, again, the special consideration language, Dr. Shirley Weber came to speak and talked about how it was included to uh, reference the contributions of free black people and enslaved black people. Next slide. Um, that corroborates with history as well. The conventions of colored citizens of the state of California from 1855 to 1865, that was clearly before the abolition of slavery. There were free African-Americans in this state um, fighting for citizenship rights because they were treated as second class citizens because the 14th Amendment had yet to be enacted. Next slide. And then that's another picture from the California African American Museum of 10, um, sorry, of delegates representing 10 of California's 27 counties met at St. Andrew's African Methodist Episcopal Church in Sacramento for the first colored convention, California Colored Convention in 1855. Next slide. Mm, next slide. Uh, next slide. All of these slides talk about um, are all lineage specific, by the way. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, why the emphasis on living African Americans? Here's a very quick primary recognition of the Genocide Convention. Uh, so in 1951, Paul Robinson, who was a human rights lawyer and a Columbia Law alumni like myself, um, along with William A. Patterson, charged the United States with genocide for the lynchings of African American people. Next slide. Use the graphics, but these are the four, the first four pages of the We Charge Genocide petition. And if you see the definitions of genocide under international law, they include killing members of the group, um, uh, causing seriously bodily or mental harm, and deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to being about the physical destruction in whole or in part, um, imposing measures intended to 
uh, uh, reverse or prevent births within the group or forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. And so essentially these human rights lawyers in the 50s um, essentially stated that the African-American uh, community um, were, was going through a genocide. Did we lose Chair Moore? I can, I can, I'm here. I can hear you, Member Grills. Can you hear me? Yeah, no, I was just asking, did we lose Chair Moore? Oh, yes. I think we did. Chair Moore is showing as having left. I don't know if you all want to wait um, for her to come back or if, I don't know yes. if, I, if, okay. Wondering while we're waiting for Chair Moore to return, uh, whether we could take a five minute break. We had a five minute lunch break and for that we started from 8.30. Does that make sense to any of the other task force members? Makes sense to me. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Fine with me. So we'll okay, we'll We'll pause there with her presentation as is, and then uh, come back at two. Yeah, it's one fifty-five. Be back at two, and I'm going to remain logged on. Thank. Okay, so we're taking a break until two o'clock. That's right. We're we're doing a five minute break until two o'clock and then you'll be able to resume. Okay, thanks. Sure. <laughs> 